guys, welcome to Baking in Books. My name is Lexi and I'm an amateur baker who loves to read. So each week I post videos of myself attempting to bake something new while also talking about a book that I really love or have recently read. Today I'm going to be making a strawberry pie. It doesn't involve dough on the top, so I'm hoping it'll be fairly simple, but honestly, you just never really know. It sounds really good, so I'm excited to get started. We're also going to be covering Harry Potter and the Deathly Hollows, which is the last book of our series. We finally made it all the way through. I can't believe it, but we did, we made it. And there's so much to talk about in this book, but hopefully we'll be able to get to a pretty decent chunk of it. If you've watched all of my other videos, then you've heard me say this before, but it's worth repeating just in case. I do not support or condone JK Rowling or anything that she believes or says, and I sincerely hope she gets the education that she needs on the subjects, but I love Harry Potter, so I wanted to pay tribute to it by starting out my channel with this series, and I know there's been other books in between, but really, I mean, I started with Sorcerer's Stone, so it's kind of fun to, to finally get to the end, and I'm excited to talk about it today with you guys. If you haven't had a chance to watch my other Harry Potter videos, or you've never read the books, or you've never seen the movies, and you're interested in doing that, I would definitely go do one of those three things before you watch this, because even the synopsis will have spoilers. But if you're all caught up, or you just don't care, and you're ready to go, then let's get started. I have to let my pie shell bake for a little while because of course it's a frozen pie shell. I'm hoping that within the next couple months I will feel brave enough to maybe try making my own crust. Uh, I know people do it all the time, but I am just not one of those people. So for right now we're going to use a frozen one and it does have to pre-bake a little bit. That's what we're waiting on right now. It's okay though because I think there's so much to talk about in this book that while we're waiting for the oven to heat up and the pie crust to go in, we can get started on going over at the, at the very least the synopsis. So this is it. This is the last book in Harry Potter series and I know this is not really related to the book uh, and and what's inside of the book. But I remember when this came out, I think I was a freshman in high school and I had been into this since, you know, I was eight, nine years old. And it was just crazy to think that after all of these years, our journey was coming to an end and we were finally gonna get answers to all of our questions and we were gonna see how Harry's life turned out and how everything went. And I just remember just the anticipation was, for this was wild. I don't think it disappointed. I never remember being disappointed at all with any of it. And I'm, I'm sure there are complaints along the way because I always get really into my books. You guys should know this by now. And I'm sure there are things that will get me heated and or that I'm really passionate about. But I just remember how much fun it was to read this and, and how emotional it was to get to the end and just realize that that was it and that we had finally made it. And I think that every time that I reread these as well, I just, I get to that end and I feel really satisfied and, and glad that we had this journey. So Deathly Hollows starts off kind of with a multitude of, of farewells. So Harry is getting ready to turn 17 and in the wizarding world, you become an adult at 17. So his protection that he's been getting from the Dursleys by returning to their home every year, he's gonna lose that. That's gonna go away as soon as he becomes uh, an adult in the wizarding world. And so it's time for him to move on. It's time for him to be kept safe other places. So in order to escape uh, Harry and the Order of the Phoenix, as well as some of his friends who are now of age, like Ron and Hermione, are going to help him escape and go to the home of one of the Order of the Phoenix that home has all of these extra protections and he can stay there until returning to Hogwarts for his final year. But not everything goes as planned, of course. And I'm trying to decide how much to give away in the synopsis. Sometimes I watch my videos and I think maybe I give too much away. Like I just tell the whole beginning of the story and then I'm like, okay, you can read the rest. But essentially the, the game plan is to get Harry out of the Dursley's home safely and to a new safe house and that he can spend the rest of the summer there and then safely return to Hogwarts and finish his last year. The problem is that Hogwarts is not going to be the same and they all know that because remember Dumbledore is dead and so there are rumors circulating that Voldemort is not only infiltrating the ministry and trying to take over the government but that he is also infiltrating Hogwarts and trying to take that over as well. And in doing so, uh, Severus Snape becomes the new headmaster, so things are a little apprehensive. But 
due to events that I won't spoil, Harry and Ron and Hermione do not decide to go back to Hogwarts. Instead, they decide to spend their time hunting Horcruxes. And the goal is, of course, to find and destroy all of Voldemort's Horcruxes, and therefore the actual man, Voldemort, can be killed. So that's their ultimate goal. Obviously, nobody's really happy with this, and Harry was told by Dumbledore to keep things a secret. So really, Ron and Hermione are the only ones that know. I mean, even the Order of the Phoenix doesn't know about the Horcruxes, they don't know how to destroy Voldemort, and honestly, I do think it's a little bit weird. It's brought up... My oven's ready. It's brought up several times in, in the book how the adults are kind of like, you know, we're adults, like, why don't you let us do this? Okay, hold that thought really quick. Let's put our, our pie shell in the oven here. Okay, it needs to be in there for like 12 to 15 minutes, so I'm gonna look at the clock, proof that sometimes I do actually pay attention to the timing of stuff. Um, mostly because I'm ready for it to come out so that I can start on the other baking things. So the adults in the world, they are kind of like, I don't understand why you have to go on this journey. You guys are barely of age. You know, you're 17 years old. You're supposed to be going to your last year of Hogwarts. And really, I, I have to agree. I don't really understand why Dumbledore didn't tell like one or two Order the Phoenix members. I mean, I know they're trying to keep secret the whole idea of the Horcruxes so that Voldemort doesn't catch on, you know, just in case they have like a leak or a, what am I looking for? A spy, yeah. Cause they've had that happen before. I mean, with Peter Pettigrew and they had that happen where, you know, somebody turned dark and was a whole spy. And so of course they're trying to avoid that. And I totally get that. But instead he puts this whole burden on Harry, tells Harry he can share it with Ron and Hermione only who are also essentially still kids. And that's it. And they're not allowed to tell anybody. I don't know. It is kind of weird. But again, like this is Harry's destiny. And Harry is also like a wanted man. I mean, as soon as Voldemort takes over the government, he's like public enemy number one. So really, he probably could not have gone back to school anyway. And Hermione couldn't have gone back to school because she's a muggle born. And, you know, Ron's family is all known to be in the Order of the Phoenix. So honestly, I mean, I guess it makes sense that they, they would go off and go on this adventure. Okay, I'm gonna cut up some strawberries while I wait for my pie shell to bake. My directions say that I just arrange half of the strawberries in the baked pastry shell. But I feel like that's, I mean, that's really thick, right? Just to put a whole ass strawberry just like in the shell. So I think I'm gonna cut them in half and lay them down really pretty. I'm gonna try to do things nice. So in any case, that ends the synopsis. Um, I don't wanna give too much away so I'm going to go ahead and say, you know, that's it. That's, that's the end of the synopsis for now. But there is quite a bit to cover. So if you don't want things spoiled for you, you haven't had a chance to read this book yet or, or see the movie or anything like that, then go ahead and skip forward until it says no more spoilers. Baking-wise, we're just waiting on the pie shell to bake. And then it should be fairly easy from there. Of course, you know, I'm sure I've said that before and things haven't turned out well, so who knows but I'm just gonna be cutting some strawberries up so that everything looks nice and pretty. So if you don't want anything spoiled, go ahead and skip ahead. But if you don't mind, you've already read the book or you just don't really care, then go ahead and stay with me and I'm gonna continue cutting my strawberries, baking our pie and getting more in depth into this book. So I guess first and foremost, let's talk about the Dursley's departure. It's kind of an awkward moment, you know? I mean, Harry has never liked these people. They don't like him, so it's, a non-emotional moment for everybody, you know? But it's kind of weird though, because he's lived with these people his whole life pretty much. And, you know, I I think Dudley's really the only one that becomes kind of emotional, and emotional is a strong word for it. He doesn't really become emotional, he's just kind of dumb and doesn't really understand what's going on. But, you know, he, he says, like, I, I don't understand why he's not coming with us. Like, I don't understand why Harry is not you know, coming with us to, to our place of safety. And everybody has to be like, well, you know, he doesn't really want to. Like, this is his own time to go about his own thing. And I think Dudley just doesn't really understand that. Which in fairness to Dudley is like, well, yeah, he's not very smart. And I'm sure nobody really explained it that well to him. But it's kind of an awkward departure. I mean, 
they're probably never going to see each other again because why would you want to? I mean, they've never gotten along. They've never been happy. You know, Harry's never been happy in their home and they've never been happy with Harry being there. So why would you like, oh, I'll find you when all this is over. <laughs> but also too, Harry has no idea how long this is gonna take. I mean, he could be hunting Horcruxes the rest of his life. So it's just kind of an awkward situation. And I think there's this kind of moment where it's like, it's almost a redemption for Dudley when you know he points out that Harry saved his life and that he is grateful for that and that you know he'll he'll miss him being around it's kind of a redemption I don't know if it's a total redemption because Dudley's really just been like a turd this whole time but really he's a product of his environment I mean if his parents didn't behave that way or let him behave that way then he wouldn't so you know whatever it's a nature versus nurture argument that I really am not that passionate about getting into then we get into the, the game plan. The plan to take Harry to a, a, a member of the Order of the Phoenix's house for safety. And, and the plan is to turn seven other people, or six other people, I guess, into Harry by Polyjuice Potion. So that there are seven Harrys going in all different directions just in case they get ambushed. And that way it's a disguise. And I'm just thinking like, who came up with this? Was it Dumbledore? Cause it was probably Dumbledore before he died. I know he's dead, so maybe it wasn't Dumbledore, but I don't know. It's just, I understand where they're coming from with the idea that, you know, oh, Harry could be with anybody and he's going in all different directions. But like, <laughs> at the same time, I don't know. It's, I just feel like there were better ways to get him from one place to another, but maybe not and they're trying to avoid all magical stuff they can't do flu powder they can't operate apparently i don't know so this is the best way is to go on brooms and thestrals and you know hagrid's, hagrid's motorbike things like that to, to get them where they need to go and of course he's with hagrid which is kind of cute and you know full circle-y but what's not cute is that they are of course ambushed and that we lose hedwig i mean really that's this this book is full of deaths and um, we've experienced that a little bit before. I mean, Cedric Diggory died in Goblet of Fire, then we lost Sirius in Order of the Phoenix, we lost Dumbledore in Half-Blood Prince. So it's kind of been like every book, there's been a big death. I mean, once we got past the first three, once we got into the real serious stuff in Goblet of Fire, we kind of lost somebody every book. But this is it, this is this is the war, this is, you know, they're fighting for their lives. So we, we started losing people pretty, Pretty much left and right and Hedwig is the first one that we lose which is really sad I mean I think Hedwig hits people a lot harder than they expect it to just because she's been there since the beginning and she's an animal you know and people get more attached to animals than they do humans don't try to argue your point you know that you do and so I think people get really depressed about Hedwig and it's really quick I mean she's there one minute she's gone the next and it's a, and there's so much going on around you that just it's a surprise moment that hits you and you don't really have time to feel it until later i mean just like harry because there's so much else going on it's a really cool scene though i mean it's there's this book is very action based right off the bat with this huge fight because of course they are ambushed by the death eaters and i mean harry and hagrid really <laughs> almost don't make it I mean, they, they barely survive Voldemort by being able to crash into the protective charms over Tonks' parents' house. But uh, they really, I mean, they almost don't make it. So it's a really dangerous fight. And of course, poor Hagrid can only do so much because he's not technically a wizard. He's not really allowed to do that much. And then we have the weird thing where Harry's wand works on its own, which is bizarre. But I think the thing that irks me the most about all of this, I mean, you know, skipping forward and you know, they, they end up being able to go to the Weasley's house with the port key, which is just like, okay, brings me back further to the point that I was making earlier. Why couldn't he just, like, why couldn't somebody just arrive at the Dursley's house, right? When, you know, two or three maybe, and make a, a port key, like to the Weasley's house where he was going. I don't understand this whole elaborate thing that everybody ends up using port keys to get to the Weasley's house, which is like the base now. So why did they go through this whole elaborate scheme just to get to the Weasley's house via port keys from like all these different houses across the country? I don't know. I, I really think it was a little too much and that's why I think maybe Dumbledore made this plan ahead of time before he died and was like, yes, this is the best plan. I don't think it really was. Once they get back to the Weasley's house, the thing that really kind of irks me is everybody gets on Harry for using Expelliarmus because they say that's how the Death Eaters knew that it was him. 
and like he was the real Harry because he used Expelliarmus instead of something more deadly or deadlier. But this always kind of irks me when I read it because Harry's not that guy and that's not the point of the Order of the Phoenix. And I know a lot of people will say, well, war is war. You have to do what you have to do to survive. But in Harry's world, he's thinking, if I can just throw them off guard, get their wand out of their hand, I mean, there's really nothing they can do to me anyway. Versus if I stupefy or heaven forbid I use the killing curse, then they're gone. I mean, they're, they're thousands of feet up in the air. So even if he just does stupefy, they're gonna fall all that way and be gone. And that's just not Harry's thing. And I think it's really commendable. I think it's kind of weird that all of the adults just suddenly like braid him for it and are like, well, that's how your cover was blown. Good going. <laughs> well, yeah, because he didn't want to kill people. I think that that sums up Harry perfectly. And I'm really proud of our hero that he didn't do that and that he stuck to his guns and didn't use anything deadly. I think that's exactly what Harry should have done based on the fact that we've been following him for like seven years of his life. Okay, so quick pause to talk about my baking. I thought that my pie shell was done, so I went to pull it out of the oven and I have made a mistake. So I thought that the pie shell should come out of its little tin container because I thought, well, maybe that shouldn't go in the oven. And uh, so I just took it out of its little tin container and put it on a baking sheet and popped it in the oven. And um, she's flat. Just totally flat and uh will not i thought maybe i could just stick it back in there i don't think it's gonna work uh the good news is that i have two pie shells because they come in packs of two thank goodness so uh give me a second to fix this mistake okay well if you're an amateur baker like me quick word of advice keep your frozen pie shells in their little tin container if they have to pre-bake and probably if they have to bake in general in the oven. <laughs> Lesson learned, we all had a good laugh, and I'm sorry that we don't get to continue with our baking right away because I'm an idiot, but hopefully that, but the, you know, the oven's already heated, it's already in there, so that should just be like another 12-ish minutes and we'll be good to go. Okay, so I'm really just gonna go chronologically as best I can with the book. I think that'll be the best way to cover everything and not really leave anything out. So, I mean, we're just gonna go with like Bill and Fleur's wedding, which, I do think it's a little odd that they're trying to have this like big elaborate wedding with everything that's going on. I mean, I I know that, you know, it says they were originally gonna get married in France and Fleur agreed to get married in the Weasley's backyard so that Harry could be there and everything could be safer, you know, and everybody's protected. But even so, Harry has to wear a disguise of the polyjuice potion. And I mean, they go through all of these elaborate things. I, I don't know. I don't know that that would be worth it to me but um i'm also somebody who recently had to put off their wedding because of covid so i'm i kind of feel like maybe there would have been a better time and a place um but fleur and, and bill are, are dead set on doing it so they go ahead with it there's a weird sound from my oven okay well i don't know what it was everything looks okay this is not off to a good start guys not off to a good start Anyway, so they go ahead with the wedding and um, it's probably like one of the most normal moments we have this whole book just because nothing's really started yet. Um, but of course, at the end of the wedding, we find out that Rufus Scrimmager is dead and that Voldemort has for sure infiltrated the government and uh, Harry, Ron and Hermione pick up and leave instantly to keep everybody safe and, and to keep themselves on the run because they know that I mean, if they get caught, then that's it. And essentially Death Eaters and the government are the same thing now. So there's just no way that they can stick around and for everybody's safety, including their own, they just bop out, which makes perfect sense. Then we have the whole tussle at the coffee shop in um, once they get out into the muggle world where the two Death Eaters just find them super quickly. It's really strange. I mean, it's kind of a scary start because they don't know how they found them. I mean, Harry can't possibly have the trace on him anymore. He's finally turned 17. So they're just really unsure about what to do. And of course, Harry for like the millionth time and not the last time is like, I should go off on my own. I'm putting you in danger. And Ron and Hermione are like, yes, we know. Like we've been in danger being your friends since we were 11 years old. It's not a surprise. Quit trying to get rid of us. But they do finally end up in 
the safety of Grimmauld Place, which is kind of creepy and dusty and dirty. But really, I mean, it makes sense that they would at least try to go there. And I think that it's kind of sad. I mean, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute, but it's kind of sad that they don't end up being able to just like use that as as their safe house for, for the rest of everything because it really starts to become more like home and it really could have saved a lot of problems, I think. The one thing that I didn't touch on was, of course, their gifts from Dumbledore's will. Ron gets the Deluminator and Hermione gets the Tales of Beetle the Bard and Harry gets the Golden Snitch and he gets the Sword of Gryffindor. But of course, he doesn't actually get it because Scrimmager is like, well, it's not his to give it you know belongs to the school or whatever and okay well now at least they know certain ways to take down horcruxes harry and hermione deduce that the reason dumbledore wanted to give him the sword is because they realize that it's impregnated with basilisk venom remember when harry stabs the basilisk in the chamber of secrets well the sword only takes that which makes it stronger and i know i just skipped ahead like a shit ton and i'm really sorry but if you're with me you really should have read the book or you can just be confused that's your own problem <laughs> um but yes so the sword is important they give the sword because the sword can has basilisk oh my gosh basilisk venom basilisk <laughs> venom and will be able to destroy horcruxes so anyway, now they have their gifts and they can move on. And of course, the thing they do deduce right after Scrimmager leaves is that there must be something in the snitch that he left Harry because snitch ha snitches have flesh memories and Harry caught it with his mouth. And of course it says, I open at the close. And they're all like, oh, what does that mean? Just another Dumbledore thing <laughs> to make everything harder. <laughs> uh, I have my issues and you know, I've already stated some of them, we'll probably get into them more later, but in any case, now they're on the run. And they're essentially safe at Grimmel Place, and they kind of test this theory a couple of times because they see some Death Eaters hanging around, but the Death Eaters clearly can't see the building, um, and they can't see them coming and going when they step out under the front stoop and apparate under the Invisibility Cloak. Of course, they're under the Invisibility Cloak, but still, I mean, if they could see the building at all, they would know. So they end up realizing that they're safe. They also end up being able to pacify Creature when they learn the story of Salazar Slytherin's necklace because they think that the necklace could be a horcrux. I mean, they know that that's what Harry and Dumbledore were after in the cave and it ends up being a fake. And so they've been looking for this person with the initials R-A-B for not that long because this was just, you know, a couple months ago. But upon entering Grimmel Place and doing some searching around the house, they realize that it's that it could be Sirius's younger brother, Regulus Arcturus Black. We'll call him Regulus. And they realize that it could be him. And so they end up getting this whole story out of Creature about how Regulus joined up with the Death Eaters and everybody was so proud. But not long after, Regulus kind of wanted to get out. And that's just not how it works in the Death Eaters. So he takes Creature and lets Voldemort use him to put the real locket in the in the base and then Regulus asks Creature well not really asks I mean he's a house elf so demands of Creature to take him back to the exact place and show him where it is and for Creature to come home so of course Regulus swaps out the necklaces and gives Creature the real necklace but of course he gets taken by the inferior eye I struggled with this in the last video too. The dead people in the water. He struggled. He gets taken down by them and Creature comes home and of course can't tell anybody what happened to Regulus and is very depressed. And so when Harry, Ron, and Hermione hear this story, they're able to kind of pacify him. And they find out that it that when the house was ransacked by Mundungus Fletcher, he took the necklace. And so Harry uses Creature to track down Mundungus so that they can figure out where the necklace is. Well, of course, because all of this isn't hard enough, the necklace was taken by Dolores Umbridge. We remember her from the Order of the Phoenix. I know we do. Well, she survived her encounter with the centaurs and now she's back in the government. And, you know, I don't know that she would ever be like a full-fledged Death Eater, but she's certainly not upset with the things that are going on in the wizarding world. So, of course, she's not a very good person and 
she is using the necklace to sort of up her blood status and saying that it's something else totally. But it's really the necklace of Salazar Slytherin and it's Horcrux, so they need it. <laughs> okay, well, quick break real quick to talk about pie shell number two. I went ahead and took it out of the oven because it's getting like puffy. We're just gonna roll with it. Nothing's really wrong with it. It seems like it's baked. So we're just gonna let it cool a minute and get going on the rest of the strawberry stuff and move on with our lives. And if it's a little puffy, it's a little puffy. As long as it's baked, that's all we care about. Oh, we're okay. I think we're okay. It's going down already. Let's see, that's why I took it out because I think, yeah, I think it'll be okay. It's gonna go down. Of course, after they give Creature the fake necklace of Regulus's and basically promise to avenge his death, Creature becomes a happier, nicer being. So that's good for them. What's not so good for them is now they have to break into the ministry. Not so good because they got to get this necklace back and they figure she probably has it either on her or in her office. So they might as well try. That's not so good. That's the first hard task. But a miniature challenge comes when Remus Lupin arrives. Remember him? We love him. He's great. However, he arrives and offers to help, you know, tells them that he doesn't need to know what's going on. They don't have to, you know, break the secret that Dumbledore is making them keep, but that he could be there for extra protection. Now on the surface, this seems like a good idea. I mean, you have an actual adult wizard and werewolf that knows a lot of protective spells. I mean, he knows a lot of defensive spells. He's obviously a lot more mature, a lot more experienced than they are. So this seems like a good idea. The problem is that earlier we discovered that Tonks and Remus got married. Yay, love. They're so happy in love. And Remus also brings the news that Tonks is pregnant. So of course, as exciting as all this is, Harry takes a minute to be like, hold up. Why are you trying to run away from your wife and new baby? And I know Hermione and Ron both kind of get on Harry for this, but I completely agree with Harry in this moment. I mean, he's really harsh with Remus and that sucks, but Remus should not be trying to abandon his wife and baby just because he feels guilty. And that's essentially what he says is I feel guilty that I could have passed on my werewolf traits to this unborn child and, and how unfair and I've made my wife an outcast. My in-laws don't like me. It's like, blah, 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 your sad story. Why did you do it in the first place? You're an adult. You fell in love, you know, and maybe against your better judgment, you got married. Well, you got married because you fell in love. There's nothing ever wrong with that. And now, of course, you're afraid of your unborn child. But the thing is, don't you think your child would be so much better with somebody to guide it, somebody that loves them, a father who could help them through experiences rather than just ditching them? I mean, what now? Like, how does that help the situation? I won't get too heated because we have a long book to go, but I completely agree with Harry in this moment. I completely agree that he gets mad and he calls Remus out and calls him names and, and calls him a, a coward. I completely agree. And I honestly think James would have done the same thing. I mean, James was a family man, as much as I have issues with James, if you'll remember. But James was a family man. He loved Lily, he loved Harry, and I think he would 100% agree with Harry. Now, of course, like, yeah, Harry was rude, but if it makes him go back to his wife and child, I don't think Harry should feel guilty at all for any of that. I think Remus definitely got what he deserved. And it worked because he does go back to Tonks and the baby, so. I've arranged some strawberries. I cut them up so they can be all cutesy and stuff. Hopefully it'll work. Maybe I, I'm a little concerned, to be honest, just so that I say it out loud so we're all on the same page. I'm a little concerned I didn't buy enough strawberries. I have a pound, I think is what it says. I wasn't really paying attention, like I just grabbed something, but... I don't know, looking at the directions, I'm a little worried that I don't have enough, but we're just gonna roll with it because there's nothing I can do now. And it's just, that's just how it's gonna be. Okay, I think I need to cut up like one more strawberry. Okay, so now they've got to break into the ministry. Not an easy task, but they spend uh, probably about a month maybe going over this really in depth plan and making sure that everything on there works finding out all of these different things about the ministry and the people that work there and honestly it is a pretty good plan i mean once we learn about all the things that they have learned and all of the information they've acquired there really is a pretty good plan i mean the trouble is just like you can't predict what is going to happen when you put yourself in a dangerous situation like that which i think is hermione's whole thing because she gets kind of worried about their plan and she's afraid that they're not ready but Harry makes the good point that they may never be ready. I mean, it's a really up in the air kind of situation. I have to mash the remaining berries. So they go 
to, of course, the ministry. And everything's going pretty well. I mean, they get in, and the problem then occurs that they get separated. And it's probably a juice potion, so they only really have an hour to make this whole thing work. Which, you know, that's the only part of the plan that I'm like, I don't know that that was really the best call. I don't know what else you could have done. But, I mean, Polyjuice Potion only giving you an hour to get in, find her office, find the necklace, and get out of there safely. I don't know. I just don't think that was really enough time. And I think my point is proven when they get separated pretty much right away. And all three of them separated, which is just an absolute nightmare. So, Harry manages to find Umbridge's office, right? And... He's going through her stuff, doesn't find the necklace, so unfortunately she's probably wearing it. And it's just like one bad problem after another. He has to get into the courtroom and get Hermione out. They don't really know where Ron is at. So everything's just kind of a mess, honestly. And they're thinking like, we should just leave this for another day and start over. And really, I don't blame them. But then of course, everything goes from bad to worse. They find Umbridge, they find the necklace, but of course they have to cause a bunch of trouble to get out of there and they barely get out of there. And unfortunately, lead the bad guys to Grimmauld Place, which means that they don't feel comfortable going back there. And I can't really blame them. I mean, they might have been able to, but they're just not sure if they brought, uh, what's his name, Yaxley, into the boundaries with them. They think they might have, so then Yaxley knows where they're at, and it's just a really dangerous situation. Okay, well, I kind of mashed the strawberries up. I don't know. I don't really understand, so... We're just rolling with it. I mean, the juices came out, they look kind of pulverized, so that's what we're gonna go with. Okay, so now that they have kind of escaped from this situation, they have to go on the, the really long camping trip. And you know, I know everybody, that's kind of like the running joke is that it's like Harry Potter and the really long camping trip. But really there's a lot that goes on. And I'm probably not gonna cover all of it because there's just a lot, but they have the necklace, they're trying to figure out how to destroy it. And then on top of that, they are trying to figure out where the next Horcruxes could be because they just don't have any idea. I, I, I don't know. I don't even know where to begin either. I mean, they make a couple of attempts, you know, they, they go back to see if the orphanage that he grew up in is still there. They already, or they already know that the cave is, you know, has been explored. They found what they needed to find in the cave. They already know that the house where the Gaunts lived were where was where the ring was so they already have that they already have the diary so they're really not looking for very many more items but they just don't know where to go and i think at least one if not two might be at hogwarts but getting into hogwarts at this point especially since they didn't show up for the first day of school and register for school is a huge danger and so they're trying to avoid that at all costs harry of course wants to go to uh his birthplace in godrick's hollow because he thinks that there might be some answers, but more so he really just wants to see, you know, where he was born and where his parents died. And I can't really say that I blame him. And I know it's a source of nervousness for Hermione. She kind of feels like Voldemort will expect Harry to go there. And the problem is that they just don't have anywhere else to go. Then of course, as time goes on, let's talk real quick about their so-called wonderful idea to wear the necklace in order to keep it safe. I understand that they're trying to keep it safe. You know, they're trying to make sure that they don't lose it or it doesn't like fall into the wrong hands if they get stuck in a dangerous situation. But wearing it, really, for 12 hours at a time? I don't get that. I, I mean, Hermione has this special bag that she keeps everything in, you know, that she keeps around her at all time. Harry also has a bag that he keeps with him at all times. And, <laughs> I understand they don't want to lose it again. Like, I understand the, the stress of the situation, but wearing it, especially once they realize that it's causing them to feel, you know, the symptoms of depression and have these really negative thoughts, just seems like maybe they could have figured out a different way to handle all of this, but whatever. So then that, you know, that's when we come across. Now, this is when we hear the conversation between um, Dean and Tonks' father, as well as the goblins that are um, on the run. They overhear the conversation about 
the kids at Hogwarts, like Ginny and Neville, trying to steal the Sword of Gryffindor so that they can send it to Harry. And that's when it dawns on Harry and Hermione, oh, that's right, it's, you know, Im impregnated with basilisk venom, so of course it would be, um, that's when they realize that, of course, you know, that's, that's exactly what we need. Well, uh, that gets Ron mad because Ron feels like, Ron feels like that's all they care about, and, you know, in, in, Ron's defense, he's the only one that, you know, is used to really being taken care of. For lack of a better phrase, he's kind of used to being babied. You know, he's used to really good meals between his mom and Hogwarts. He's used to having, you know, other people that can, you know, help him out of a, a hard situation. But now he's stuck in this situation where he doesn't always get a good meal and he is, uh, always on the lookout for this stuff and of course the necklace doesn't help so that's when Ron kind of dips out and um I mean it is of course a little bit of a surprise because it's kind of like you don't really expect one of the golden trio to leave I mean Ron and Harry have had their differences in the past but to just completely dip is kind of a strange thing but that's what happens so you know Ron leaves and of course Hermione is devastated because as we've talked about in multiple books Hermione and, and Ron really care about each other even though they don't know how to say it but she sticks with Harry and I think that's the right decision I mean I love Ron and Hermione together and I you know I love their little relationship but like she says to Ron you know we promised that we would help and we promised that we would do this with Harry and Harry's our friend and I think that you know it's really brave of her to just stick it out so they do eventually decide that they need to go and try out godric's hollow which you know i do think makes sense they don't have any other ideas they don't know where else to go so why not right so they go to godric's hollow and of course they're using polyjuice potion and the invisibility cloak for extra protection and you know there's this really sweet kind of sad moment you know when they go into the graveyard and they're able to see the graves of Dumbledore's family and eventually find James and Lily's you know it's a really sweet sad moment and it's very brother and sisterly I think that's that's what a lot of people miss like if you're somebody that thinks that Harry and Hermione should have ended up together let me just use this one moment as an example that this is a very brotherly sisterly moment you know she's there trying to help him discover his family and say goodbye to the parents that he never knew. And I don't think there's anything romantic about this situation. And I, I don't think there's supposed to be. You know, I think she's a friend trying to help him get it together, you know, and, and kind of move on past that point in his life. And I think that that's a really beautiful moment. A very beautiful moment that is shattered by Bethelda Bagshot as she gets them to come to her house so that supposedly she can give Harry the sword, but in reality, she's Nagini, which, I mean, it's just gross. You know, like, they did a pretty good job of making it gross and weird in the movie, but when you read it in the book, like, it's just so much worse. It's so gross and so weird that she just, like, pops out of her neck and attacks. It's just absolutely disgusting. And, of course, they, like, barely survive, and Voldemort just barely misses them. And so they're pretty shaken by that for obvious reasons. And then not long after that, you have the moment with the doe, the Patronus that comes out and um, and tries to lead Harry away, which he does. I mean, a part of me thinks like, Harry, you're such an idiot, you know? I mean, I get he says it feels like it is a friend. It feels like it's a safe thing. And it is at the end of the day, but, oh, Harry. Anyway, he finds the sword he gets Ron back, they stab the, the necklace, uh, which is just beautiful. And they have this very brotherly moment, you know, where Harry talks about, uh, Hermione doesn't see me that way and I don't see her that way. And, you know, I, I just figured you knew that. I mean, I just figured we were all on the same page like that. Okay, I think this is thick enough. I don't, I don't want to burn it. So we're just gonna, we're just gonna chill out for a sec. Um, so yeah, so, you know, they, they get Ron back and of course Hermione's pissed. I would be too. I mean, as much as you might care for somebody, he dipped out on them. 
and they almost got killed in Godric's Hollow. I mean, maybe if they'd had an extra person on hand, they would have accomplished a lot more. I don't know. But I think Hermione's just holding a grudge, and I think she has every right to be mad. Ron really tries his best to atone for his sins, and he kind of comes in full force, which is such a great thing about Ron. Ron is one of the best characters just because, you know, he really is a good friend, and he really is just there to do the best that he can and and he knows he made a mistake so he's trying to make up for it okay well i forgot to hit record i thought i was i was talking to you guys the whole time um but i went ahead and poured my strawberry goopy mixture here into the pan i'm trying to smooth it out and make it really nice looking because this is it like it doesn't have any other decorations i think i i probably needed a little more strawberries um i just think that because there's not quite enough of the strawberries in the goop to kind of come all the way up to the edge of the pie shell, but I think that's just life. I kind of want to taste this goop, but it is like steaming, so I'm a little bit afraid to. All right, well, this has to chill for several hours, so there it goes, off to chill. In the meantime, I'm, I'm supposed to be making, I guess, homemade whipped cream. So I guess you could buy whipped cream to put on top of this. Um, however, I guess I'm gonna try to make my own with a half cup of whipping cream. I don't know about that, but I guess we'll try. At least we still have plenty to talk about. I mean, it's literally just this. Okay, well, we'll try. Okay, well, in any case, where are we? Oh, that's right. Okay, well, now we're gonna go see Xenophilius Lovegood right? Luna's dad. We met him for the first time at Bill and Fleur's wedding, but we know about him because uh, obviously his daughter Luna is part of the, the crew, but also we know that he runs the Quibbler, which Harry gave an interview to in the fifth year in, in Order of the Phoenix about his experiences in Goblet of Fire. So we've kind of heard about him. We met him at the wedding. He's a bizarre creature, but you know, for the most part, he's been printing how people need to support Harry. So they're going to go and see him and see if maybe they can figure out this story that Hermione has come across. Remember, she was given the Tales of Beetle the Bard by Dumbledore. And she's intrigued by the Tale of the Three Brothers because it has that symbol that Xenophilius was wearing around his neck. Now, at the wedding, Victor Crumb said to Harry that it was Grindelwald's sign carved in, in the school uh, at Durmstrang. And he got really upset about it because he was like, Grindelwald was a bad guy, obviously, so Xenophilius should not be wearing that sign. So they're conflicted because why is it in children's books if it's Grindelwald's sign and why would Xenophilius be wearing it? So they're gonna go check him out. But of course that is an absolute disaster, but they do learn something from it. They learn the tale of the three brothers, which basically talks about the, uh, the wand of destiny, the death stick, the Elder Wand, the Resurrection Stone, and the Invisibility Cloak. Now, of course, this causes basically division in their group because Harry feels like Voldemort sent him on this quest for a reason. I mean, he has an Invisibility Cloak. He knows that those kind of things do exist and that his is never failing. I mean, other Invisibility Cloaks lose their their whole magic over time, you know, and they're, they're not really that good after a while but his has never failed them in all that time i mean he they're completely invisible so then of course he thinks that the resurrection stone must be in his snitch and that voldemort must have had the elder wand but hermione doesn't believe any of it which is pretty typical hermione you know i mean she does like to see proof of things and uh she does like to have actual answers and so she kind of feels like it was a whole waste of their time especially because they almost got caught by death eaters and ron honestly is just eager to please hermione <laughs> i think he just doesn't want to piss her off anymore so he's just kind of like yeah, yeah yeah let's just keep hunting horcruxes so they do a little bit of, of both, but okay. So eventually they realize that the reason Harry was, that Harry was found so easily after they escaped the wedding was because Ron tells them about the taboo on Voldemort's name. That basically, if you say his name, then it like sets off a warning and, and Death Eaters can find you really easily. And so that's how a lot of Order of the Phoenix or really like, um, upstanding brave citizens are being found because they're um, they're they're saying Voldemort's name and Death Eaters are able to find them. So Harry gets real up in arms because he just knows that there's a horcrux at Hogwarts, that the resurrection stone is in the snitch, and 
that Voldemort had the Elder Wand. And then his whole thing is if he can get the Deathly Hollows, he can take down the Horcruxes and conquer Voldemort and therefore conquer death. And unfortunately, in all of his excitement, he says Voldemort's name. So they end up getting caught, taken to the Malfoy's house, right? This is just a crazy time. I mean, for one thing, they find Luna and Dean, which they didn't expect in the basement, as well as Ollivander, who they knew had been captured, but there he is. And Hermione gets tortured. Crazy, absolute crazy moment. I mean, Hermione really endures a lot and she keeps everything really secretive and wrapped up. But because of this, they realize that, that Bellatrix is losing her shit because she thinks they've been inside her vault. Because they have the sort of Gryffindor, remember? He retrieved it out of the pool on the night that Ron came back. Well, she thinks the sort of Gryffindor is in her vault. So she thinks they've been inside her vault. Now, after Dobby shows up and bravely saves them and unfortunately dies, they realize that they're gonna have to break into Bellatrix's vault. So Dobby is really the third death that we encounter. And it's sad, I mean, Dobby's been with us off and on since the second book and he's a, a character that everybody loves and he gives his life so that they can survive. And of course, you know, it hits Harry. I mean, every death is really difficult. They're still kids. I mean, I know the wizarding world sees them as adults, but they're kids and it hits him really hard. And he, Dobby's been around for a long time and it hit us all pretty hard. It was a really sad moment, but they know that they have to get into Green Gods. And so they team up with Griphook, uh, the goblin that was also captured with them and also escaped to, to make a game plan. And they're at Bill and Flora's and they're safe and they know that they just they can't rely on that safety forever they've got to get healed up and they've got to go it's a crazy idea i mean breaking into gringotts is nuts and they set that up beautifully i mean she who must not be named set that up really beautifully in the first book by setting up all of this idea that no place is safer for something than gringotts and hogwarts i mean that's those are the big two so they know this is going to be a big deal and of course you know they're they're using Bellatrix's wand and the skies of Hermione as Bellatrix to kind of mask them and they don't realize until they get there that that was probably really stupid because they don't know anything about what happened after they left Malfoy Manor and now they're finding out that everybody that was at Malfoy Manor is basically in quarantine. <laughs> we all know about that, right? So they're not allowed to leave and so when you know another Death Eater comes up he's surprised to see her out and about. And she, you know, Hermione plays it off really well because Bellatrix is, a, is an arrogant woman. But still, I mean, it is kind of like they're not supposed to be out and they didn't realize that. And so the plan just honestly starts to backfire a little bit at a time. And by the time they get all the way in, I mean, you've got alarm bells going off. They're trying to find this Horcrux. And of course, getting out is a nightmare. But I guess on the good side, um, they set the dragon free. <laughs> And they do get the Horcrux, so I mean, it was kind of a messy situation, but they got out okay. But in any case, let's move right along. They know that they have to go to Hogwarts because Harry can, you know, still has this connection with Voldemort and he does kind of see into his mind sometimes. And now Voldemort knows they're hunting Horcruxes. So he is off to check the different places. And of course, in his mind, he thinks about Hogwarts because that's one of his hiding places. And so Harry's like, I told y'all, like we just, we have to go. There's no more plans, there's no more time, let's just go. And sneaking into Hogsmeade almost gets them caught again. But that's when they get to meet Aberforth Dumbledore, who's kind of a, just a grumpy old man. I mean, he joins the battle eventually, but he really is just kind of a grumpy old man. Uh, and that's when they learn the truth about Dumbledore's life. I mean, the fact that, you know, he was this brilliant guy, but after his mom died and he had to take care of his sister, is when he met Grindelwald and he everything just sort of everything else was out the window you know he just wanted his sister to not have to be in hiding he just wanted wizards to not have to be in hiding and you know Harry takes this really harsh I mean I don't know that it's really that big a deal I mean I think Dumbledore didn't necessarily want like domination the way that Grindelwald did I think he just wanted to not have to hide and he didn't want to have to be in charge of his sister or his brother he just wanted to have his freedom and i think that's how he kind of got away from him and i think harry really just thinks too much about it i think yes he should have known better but at the same time he was going through stuff that nobody else was really going through i mean he became the head of his household all of a sudden when he really had the potential to be so much better than that 
Uh, and I do think he learned from it. I mean, I have my issues with Dumbledore, but I really think that the reason he became such a symbol for justice is because of these these months with Grindelwald and, you know, the fact that his sister was murdered. And by whom, we don't know. But uh, because Dumbledore thinks he had a hand in it, it really changes him. So I think Harry just, it's not the same. Like, they don't live the same life. They don't make the same decisions. Like, it's just a totally different thing. And I think Harry thinks too much about it. But in any case, they learn that story and they get into Hogwarts, getting to see Neville again, leading them into the room, room of requirement. And after they get here, everything's just so fast. So forgive me if I forget stuff. I mean, there's a, there's a lot we could cover, but let's just cover the basics, okay? Everybody shows up, there's gonna be a war. And um, Voldemort figures out that Harry's at Hogwarts and he's like, hey, yep, I'm coming for you. Uh, and Harry's like, I'm just trying to get this Horcrux and get the hell out of here. So his first stop is to, to figure out if the last Horcrux is the Diadem of Ravenclaw. The problem is nobody's ever seen it, but he soon figures out that no living person has ever seen it. And he tracks down Helena Ravenclaw, who's Rowena Ravenclaw's daughter. And it turns out that Tom Riddle at school kind of weaseled out of her the hiding place of the Diadem. So he found it and brought it back to Hogwarts after turning it into a Horcrux and hit it. So now Harry's gotta go find it. And he realizes that he's seen it before in Half-Blood Prince when he was hiding his potions book. He's seen it before, so now he's gotta go in and find it. The problem is Draco and Crabbe and Goyle come up on the scene. And this is the moment where it's like, Draco, my dude, you had time to redeem yourself, okay? You spent the whole sixth year realizing that Voldemort is crazy and that the things he's asking you to do are ridiculous and you almost die and you get caught and you know Dumbledore dies right in front of you I mean you would think that he would be like yeah I'm good I'm gonna I'm gonna back out of this see you guys later but he doesn't he's just like I'm gonna stop you and he he's terrible I mean he has no authority all that swagger he had when he was younger is just totally gone uh and you know Crab and Goyle I don't remember who starts it Crab Goyle one of them starts the, the fire, which ends up getting them killed. And um, <laughs> I kind of like this moment when Ron is like, well, he's dead. So, sorry, after they get out. And it's really harsh, but it's like, well, your dumbass friend started this fire and then he died in it. And what did you expect? But they do get the diadem and it goes away. So they've destroyed the cup because Ron and Hermione were smart enough to go down into the chamber and get the basilisk fangs, which is also the moment that they kissed for the first time, which is super cute and very inappropriate for the moment, but you know, we're all like, yay. Uh, so everything has been destroyed, except for the last Horcrux, which they think must be Nagini the snake. The problem is getting to her is gonna be like crazy. So they're going through this whole battle. Then we lose Fred, which honestly is just, that's one of the hardest ones. I mean, I guess at this point, we've lost Hedwig, Mad-Eye, and Dobby, so we kind of expect more people are gonna die. I mean, this is a war and it's a big, ugly one. But I don't think I personally expected to lose one of the Weasley family members. Uh, I thought, if anything, maybe one of the parents, but losing Fred was harsh. I mean, I just, I just remember that being a horrible thing. And it, it was just, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but you know, they find a way to continue. Then they end up witnessing Snape's death because Voldemort believes that he can't truly possess the Elder Wand and all of the power that comes with it until Snape is dead because Snape killed Dumbledore and Dumbledore was the last owner. So he kills Snape um, and then just kind of bounces out, which leaves Harry free to take Snape's memories which honestly is one of my favorite chapters. It's so interesting to get Snape's backstory. And I mentioned in other books that Snape just has the biggest journey. And while I still stand by what I said in the earlier videos about, you know, Snape could have definitely been a good guy and he chose his routes and he definitely could have not been a jerk, but you know, he chose his path. I think that this is just the moment of clarity for a lot of the things that he's been through. I mean, looking at his childhood and how he had a terrible childhood, but Lily was, you know, like the only friend that he had. And he gets bullied from day one for wearing, you know, cheap clothing. I mean, they, he doesn't have a lot of money and he's just trying to enjoy school. But, you know, the only people that include him aside from Lily are other boys that end up being Death Eaters. 
So it's almost no really surprise that he kind of ends up going down that road. Uh, I think maybe if he and Lily would have ended up being in the would have ended up being in the same house, like if he'd have been in Gryffindor, or she'd have been in Slytherin, or, or you know whatever. I think it would have been different. But I think because they were separated, they didn't really get a whole lot of time to spend together, and it allowed him the opportunity to kind of go down that that dark path that he should not have been down in the first place. I mean, you give and take some. What are you gonna do? And at least he's willing to tell the truth. I mean, he shares all of his memories and everything that Harry needs right at the end with Harry, um, which of course is when he discovers that he himself, Harry, is a Horcrux and that he's gonna have to die, which is crazy. <laughs> it's just a whole thing. And then it goes all the way back to Dumbledore. And I don't know if I have the energy to be angry at Dumbledore again, because I've kind of already said my piece on him, but he, one of the things Snape said is like, you've been raising him like a lamb for slaughter or a pig, I don't remember, whatever. He's been raising him for slaughter and that, and that is essentially what he's been doing. And he it sends Harry on this quest because if Harry dies in the process, then it still benefits the, de the, de the destroying of Horcruxes and Ron and Hermione can continue on the journey. So that's why, I mean, we come full circle to figure out why Dumbledore didn't end up letting one of the adults take this journey because if Harry succeeds, then that's great. And, and nobody is gonna have more passion than Harry to succeed. But if Harry fails, one of the Horcruxes still dies. So Harry kind of comes to terms with going to his death so we get Harry out to the forest and figure out what the eye open at the close means. It means, you know, he's about to die. So he does get the resurrection stone, gets to see his parents and Sirius and Lupin again, and kind of take that journey with him. I think it's, it's a really brave moment for Harry. I mean, if any of us were put in that situation, like we know that Voldemort has to die, but the, the idea that we have to walk into our own death we can't do anything about it and we can't try to save ourselves. We've just gotta die. I don't think a lot of people could really handle that. I mean, I would like to think that I'd be brave enough to do that if I knew that it was for the greater good, but I don't know that a lot of people could. I don't know that I could. So I think it's a really brave moment for Harry. So then we, you know, he does die and we experience this whole thing with Dumbledore. And I, I think my favorite part of the chapter is that at one point Dumbledore's talking to him and he gets kind of emotional and Harry kind of gets angry at Dumbledore because he's like, how can you just, like, how do you have the right to sit there and be so pitiful and feel so guilty when, like, I'm trying to be angry at you because you put me on this whole journey? And I completely agree. Like, Dumbledore definitely could have been a lot more forthcoming. He definitely could have, like, helped them along a little bit more. And I think he specifically chooses not to. And he does that every year in Hogwarts. He could help. He could, help. He could push them along a little further, but he doesn't. Oh, well, whatever. He's dead, so moving on. Um, but Harry decides to go back, you know, he's got unfinished business. I don't know that I could have played dead as long as he does. He really like goes for it. And I know not a lot of people are paying attention to him. And obviously Narcissa knows he's alive, but she just really wants to find her son. So she doesn't care. So they, you know, go all the way back to Hogwarts and leads us into this huge battle. And of course, one of the best moments of the entire series is when Molly kills Bellatrix and just she like steps up fights her like a pro and then just like slaughters her and i love bellatrix because she's an amazing villain but molly weasley is like the ultimate mom and to see her just like lose her shit to protect her kids and kill one of the strongest villains in the book is amazing i and i absolutely love it i love that choice to have her kill bellatrix and i think the whole moment is amazing but of course that leads to Harry and Voldemort's showdown, where we learn that really the owner of the Elder Wand is Harry because Draco disarmed Dumbledore in the tower. So even though he didn't kill him, he disarmed him, which made Draco the owner of the Elder Wand. While at Malfoy Manor, Harry disarmed Draco, which made him the owner of the Elder Wand. And so of course Harry is able to defeat Voldemort, kill him, and then he repairs his old one and snaps the other one in half. <laughs> I probably would have done the same. I'm not one has caused so much destruction over the years. Why keep it? You know, he was perfectly happy with his old wand, so why worry about it? Obviously, there's going to be a lot of healing, but we pretty much just skip ahead 19 years to the first day of school for Harry's youngest son. Uh, I know there's a lot of debate about the name <laughs> Albus Severus, which my biggest issue is it's just a crappy name. <laughs> like, just I think Albus is a bad name to begin with and doesn't really suit you until you get to be really old but just it's a crappy name to begin with but I do understand why he did it I mean his oldest son's name is James so he named him after his son his daughter's name is Lily named him after his mom dad mom 
got it. Um, I think he left Lupin's name for his own son. I mean, Teddy might have children someday and he might want to use that. I know there's a lot of debate about Hagrid, that Hagrid's name should have been used, but Hagrid is still alive and is still capable of doing a lot. Plus, Hagrid is also a really bad name, so I just, I don't think there's a win-win here. I understand why he chooses Dumbledore and Snape, because while they were both asshats at different moments along the way, they did both help him to the end of his journey. And I think they were both strong men and brave men in their own ways. And I, you know, I get where he's coming from. I don't know that it's the best choice, but uh, I, I understand where he's coming from. And I think it's cute to see their little family and Ron and Hermione's little family. You even get a, a glimpse of Draco and his family. You know, hopefully he's been able to kind of get out of all of his old Death Eater bad habits. Um, and you know, it ends with all is well. And it is, it's just, it, it leaves you with that feeling of we did it, we made it, and it's a good feeling. Okay, if you left because of spoilers, go ahead and rejoin us. I think I've covered everything I could possibly cover, although I'm sure there's stuff that I missed. But our strawberry pie is out of the fridge after cooling for a little bit. I'll let you see it. So you can see that it's not quite, like there's not a ton of filling in there. It doesn't go all the way up to the top, but that's okay. I mean, we it's a first attempt, so now we know. I also made my own whipped cream, although it literally is just heavy whipping cream. So I feel like it's not quite as sweet. I'm gonna use a small amount on it on this first bite just because I'm afraid it's gonna be really bitter. So let's cut into this. I accidentally broke the top off, but you can see inside of it, you can see the beautiful strawberries there. That's pretty lovely. Okay, let's taste it without the whipped cream first. I mean, it tastes like strawberry. I think the crust is done, so that's good. Okay, I'm gonna put a little bit of the whipped cream on there and see if it changes the flavor or if it works at all. I don't know. I feel like it's really bitter. Actually, yeah, it's not that bad. By itself, it doesn't really have that much flavor, but when you put it on the actual pie, the sweetness of the pie kind of helps cover up oh my, the, the bitterness of the heavy cream. I'm also thinking the longer that I look at it, I know it said to put strawberries in the bottom. Uh, this is just a personal preference, I think, but I think I would have chopped the strawberries up a little bit smaller. I did half for most of them, unless they were those really fat ones and I did thirds and kind of laid them down. I honestly think I would have chopped them just a little bit smaller, maybe chopped them up in general, like in the little cubes almost and sprinkled them about the bottom. Just because if you get a whole strawberry, I don't know if you will be able to see it, but if you get a whole strawberry, like what's going on right here, when you dig in, you literally are just getting strawberry and crust. So you're not really getting much of the puree on top because the strawberries are kind of doing their own thing. Yeah, I don't know. That's just like my personal opinion, but it doesn't taste bad by any means. And it's kind of like a funny little look because you can see with like holes where the strawberry was. I would definitely say that today was a success. So thank you guys so much for joining me today. Um, I had a really good time. I feel like this was a good pie. I'm definitely gonna keep this recipe, it's delicious. And I hand whipped my first whipped cream. So I would say that's a, that's a big applause to me personally. A round of applause because I did it and it didn't turn out horrible. <laughs> and we made it through the entire Harry Potter series. I love this book. I think it's a great way to end the series. Obviously I recommend it. And if you've been reading along, you're so close finish. Yes, she's a little thick, but you're getting all the answers and everything everything goes down in this book. It's a little bit of an emotional roller coaster, but truly there is a happy ending and um and I'm I love the way that Harry's story plays out after all of these years. If you can shop local or rent from your local library. If you're a nerd like me and you wanna buy them, you can buy them anywhere, but if you find them in a local bookshop, that is the most special, and being able to support small business. If you have other books that you think I might like, throw them in the comments, I'm open to anything. If you have other recipes you want me to try, you can throw those down there as well. Even if they're difficult, I can always put them on my to-do later list, but I really appreciate you guys. I had a lot of fun today, and I will see you guys next time. Bye.